Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the time that you've given us to feast upon your word. Filter out all of that which is foolish. Seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to thank you all uh, again for joining us in our studies here in uh, 1 Corinthians, the uh, epistle, the first epistle to the Corinthians. Uh, in this series of videos, we've been going through this verse by verse, and uh, we've just now gotten to the sixth chapter. Chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 1. I'd like to take some time to discuss some underlying truths that are not immediately apparent in the few verses that we're about to look at. Uh, they're somewhat controversial as well. Why are you here listening to me? You know, if you're here because you feel sorry for me as a, an old man, then don't click on these videos. Having friends, being friends in Christ is really a wonderful thing. But ministry and church, you know, it's not a Christian social club. Why do you go to the church that you go to? You know, because it has a, a three... A, a three alley uh, bowling, a uh, three lane bowling alley, swimming pool, basketball court, ping pong tables, I, and uh, you know who knows what. A, a quick fifteen minute Bible study, and then you can sit around and visit. You know the kids can well they can play games because you know it's a good place to get a free meal. Is that what church is? Why do people go to church? You know I, I've had people say. To me, well, you know, we we picked the church that we did because our parents went there, or we picked the church we did because our kids like it. Well, that's probably the the worst reason in the world. You know, if the, if the kids like it, well, they're surely not being fed solid biblical food. If you're having a lot of fun in church, you're probably really probably not learning anything essential. Now, that's just my own personal view. Our first concern should be, are we being taught solid biblical truth? What is this church's stand? What, what is their theology? You know, uh, going to Christian church for fellowship. I can't argue with that. I mean, I enjoy Christian fellowship on Facebook, wherever I can find it. But that can be done done separate from what we would call an organized church, it seems to me that we are called together to feast on the Word of God and to enjoy each other's fellowship. And if that feast isn't there, then I don't see how we can call it a church or an online ministry or, or anything else. You know, whether it's a brick and mortar structure, you know, a, a pole barn, or social media platform. We go where we go because we want to learn what God says. We are, dearly beloved, we are a body of believers who are saints. And our entire upbringing, our entire background leads us to look at production and merit. What did the thief on the cross do to go to heaven? Nothing. What did the beggar do? Nothing. And, and if, for those of you out there who think, well, that isn't fair, you know, immediately your theology is wrong. A person doesn't go to heaven because of what he does, he or she does. Most Christians know that we don't really, I mean, at least a lot know that we don't go to heaven because of what we do, but 99% of them don't believe it. Christians 
they loudly profess, oh, I know I'm saved by grace, and yet they live like they're saved by merit. Well, Steve, you got to admit, you know, the God likes the one who tries more than the one who doesn't try. Folks, I don't know how hard the thief, on, the thief on the cross tried. I don't know how hard the beggar tried. How can you say that if you know biblical truth? Now, personally, I don't mean to be judgmental, and maybe I am, you know, to some extent. But most of God's people don't know very much solid biblical truth. And if they do know it, well, they don't really believe it or, or they don't really trust it or they don't trust God concerning it. You know, I don't know how many people have said to me over the years uh, in some kind of what we would call tragedy. I, I don't see how there can be tragedy in a Christian's life. You know, well, God is in control. And it, it's an easy thing to say. But you look at their life and they apparently, they don't believe what they really just said. You know, he's in control. The only reason, the only possible reason that any of us are going to heaven is because Jesus Christ died in our place. Nothing more. None of us deserved heaven. None of us merits God's grace. None of us have earned our way to heaven. We are new creations in Christ Jesus by no action of our own. No choice, no decision, no action, no production, nothing. Only because He died in our place. But because, because while we were yet sinners, God's enemies, angry at God, he died in our place. And so why wouldn't I want to learn as much as I can about what this one said who died in my place? Do I go to some church or join some group realizing that God Almighty, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who hung the stars in the, in the heavens, not only came to earth to be my kinsman redeemer, made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not only that, but He willed to do that because, because He loved me. I'm not redeemed because I loved Him. I love Him because He first loved me and He died in my place. He died the death that I should have died. That's why I'd want to go to church. That's why I want to study. That's why I want to fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, it, it seems to me like if a man really fell in love with a woman, he'd want to find out what she likes. You know, he wouldn't uh, spend his time buying food for her that she did, doesn't like to eat. Why, folks, why is that not infinitely more important in my relationship with Christ? What did my God say? And I've talked to ministers, other Christians over the years. I've talked to people, I've talked to Christians who say things that are directly contradictory to what's in Scripture. You know, makes me wonder if they even study at all. They must not study. If they do, they apparently don't believe what, what they read, what they study. Any one of you who believes what Jesus Christ said, you believe it because you're already His sheep. You didn't do anything to become His sheep. You didn't deserve to be His sheep. You weren't seeking to be His sheep. You aren't a lost sheep looking for that shepherd, you know, as if he was the one that was lost. You're his sheep because he chose you in Christ before 
the foundation of the world. You are always his sheep. Even though the modern church has bamboozled you, even though that they, they will profess loudly that you used to be headed for hell, but if you might, you know, if you just make the right step, if you just take the right step, if you make the right decision, if you can go, if you dot all your 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 I's and cross all your T's, you can go to heaven. It's all up to you, and 90% of your friends believe that. And that, dearly beloved, is not biblical. But they believe that. You don't go to heaven because of what you believe. You don't go to heaven because of something that you do. And those who have hungry hearts and want to know what this book says, I would like to be, it's always been my prayer that this be a fellowship where the, the reason that we gather together here on this channel is because we sincerely adore the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that this is His Word. We believe that it is His Word to us. And we eagerly want to know what it says. Is that the reason you're here? And, and the, is that the reason I'm here? That's what I want it to be. But I, I come back to this simple statement. Why do you have to be diligently and eagerly and, and earnestly concerned about what your Lord said to go to heaven? You're going to spend years coming to a, a, a small, barely known YouTube channel, you know, where we study and where we're concerned about all the technical aspects of grammar, you know, and doctrine. You know, when there's somebody out there just, well, just plodding along in life, you're both going to heaven. If you, if you belong to Him, you're both going to heaven. So what difference does it make? I mean, you're all saints. Those of you who are diligent in Bible study and those of you who aren't, you are both headed to heaven. So what difference does it make? I mean, really, I'm, it's not, what difference does it make? Well, you might say reward. But... Even as important as reward is, reward is not the basis of our fellowship here, nor will it be the basis of our fellowship in glory. Dearly beloved, the grace of God is our testimony. That's our testimony. Our testimony is not, well, you know, just, you know, what an awful person I was, and I was, you know, this and that and the other thing. You know, and until I made a decision to come to Jesus Christ, therefore others need to do the same thing I did. They need to do the same. And, that, and yet that is what defines modern evangelism today. Our testimony to the world and to one another is the grace of God in that we as His sheep who, who always belong to Him we were the ones who were lost and that He found us. Romans 3, Romans chapter 3. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks after God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. God's grace, folks, is what defines us as Christians. His grace is our testimony to a lost and dying world. His grace is our testimony to one another. So, we're going to step into that legal court of the world, that legal system, in order to settle disputes among the brethren. Or that our, our testimony to the world then becomes something contrary to the very uh, grace of God that we both believe and, and we preach? Is that what we're going to do? 
Same with marriage. What I'm trying to highlight and, and maybe be saying it poor is the reason that we should care about our testimony before one another and before the world, the unjust, isn't because of reward. It isn't any, any concept of earning our way to heaven, but be, because we love Him who died for us so that our lives become a witness, a testimony of the grace that God bestowed upon us as creatures who deserved nothing but hell. And that includes grace shown toward one another. And dragging one another into court to settle some minor dispute is contrary to that, to that grace. And I say minor because the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8.18 so why not suffer wrong instead, if need be? Chapter 6 begins, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the righteous? Because when we, when we go before the righteous to settle some dispute, the verdict, uh, the judgment, will always or, or should always be seasoned with grace. You know, it's argued by many people that you can really see that, Paul, well, Paul's got a problem here because we have at the end of chapter uh, uh, 6 here, fornication again, okay? So, you know, somehow, you know, Paul must have got his thoughts mixed up. He must have jumbled over his thoughts when he started chapter 6. But this is not Paul's logic. This is not Paul's thinking. This is not Paul putting this together in any logical or, or illogical order. This is God's Word. There is no conjunction between the end of five and the beginning of six. You know, as though, as though the Holy Spirit is going right on. We don't go to law before the unjust. We, the righteous, don't go to law before the unjust and, and not before the saints. Why? Why? Why is it? Well, because we're not under law. Spiritual fornication is living under the law as a rule of life. I spoke about that in, in a previous video. What the text is not saying, it is not saying that you have nothing to do with the legal system of justice as far as, as criminal matters are concerned. That's, that's... If you are in a court accused of murder that's well that's murder okay the state has a case against you you don't have a case against the state the state has a case against you murder is wrong this is not that kind of case this is a christian having a matter concerning another christian where one has a matter concerning the other. And these are minor disputes. Do you have the right to seek justice before unrighteous people and not before righteous people? That's the underlying concept here that we're looking at. You are righteous people. Okay? You are people set apart for God, by God, and in that setting you apart, He made you righteous. You're not righteous by the way you live, by the way you think, or, or by the way you act. You are righteous because Christ was made sin for you. 
and you were made the righteousness of God in Him. Fantastic, wonderful truth. You don't hear it a lot. You're going to hear it here. And we need to grasp that truth. You are righteous. You are set apart for God. I am pretty positive that you'd rather have your problem between uh, another brother or sister in the Lord dealt with in the hands of those that you love and trust that you know who love the same Lord that you do than before the unrighteous, the unjust. In a civil court, Christianity, folks, is not supreme. You know, just to just try quote, quoting scripture if you don't believe me, and you'll hear some some lawyer or some judge say that there, you know, there'll be none of that in this court. Okay, God is not in this court. Okay, that's an unjust court in the eyes of God. Why? Because we can't bring Christianity into it. We can't bring our faith and trust in the Lord into it as a defense, okay? But we can, if those matters, if we judge disputes between brethren in, within the church. I think it's important that we understand this. I do not believe that the text is saying, first of all, that you never go into a civil or criminal court, a normal court. Not saying that. This is a dispute between brethren. If someone has done you wrong, something that uh, has to do with the fellowship, you know, completely separate from, you know, the, the cases of like Perry Mason cases, such as in business and, or whatever, and you need to bring suit against them, this passage of Scripture is not teaching against that. I want to make that clear. You know, I have had, I've heard Christians say, I've, I've had Christians say to me, well, you know, you should never go to, to law court with anybody ever at any time. Well, that may be a good piece of advice, but it's not biblical. And, and I personally, I'd think twice about doing that. You know, like a guy I once knew you know, who said, well, I'm suing this guy because I know I'm in the right. I, and I said, well, you know, are, all you're going to do is wind up paying attorneys. No, no, no. He said, I'm going to win. I'm going to win this case. Well, he did. He won. He won $100,000 in the lawsuit. You know, and I said, well, what do the legal fees cost you? Oh, $175,000. But I won. Well, he'd been, he'd been $75,000 ahead if he had just forgotten about it. Now, that's a civil court or a legal court, with, you know, what we consider normal court. That is not the subject here. But if somebody violates your, your let's say, your patent, you're an inventor, and you've invented the newest mousetrap, and I believe you have every right to call an attorney you want and file suit, whatever you want to do. But, but this, folks, is a trivial dispute between brethren. How do I know that? Well, because the text says that. Look at verse 2. Are you not unworthy to judge the smallest matters, the most trivial matters? Okay. So God's talking about trivial disputes among Christians between brothers, the brethren. We're not looking at a church here where, you know, somebody says, you know, I want the elders to come in and judge uh, the matter because that guy over here, he killed my wife and I want them to judge that. That's not what we're talking about here. Not what we're talking about. We are talking about the common disputes, minor disputes that exist between Christians, and they shouldn't be aired to those who are not in the body of Christ. Dare any of you, 
Uh, the context makes it clear. It's, it's another Christian. It's another brother or sister in Christ. Are you going to seek justice before unrighteous people rather than those who are righteous? And that's the concept that I've been trying to build. All of you people here who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ are righteous. You're set apart. We saw that right at the beginning of this study. You're set apart by God and, and surely with your interest in the scriptures, your interest in the Lord, you would be a much better group of people to judge between brethren than those who are unjust. Even by, even, even by the one who is the least esteemed among you, okay? I'm not trying to make any claim against a modern civil court, a normal court. But that court, folks, is not a Christian institution. It is a legal institution. And you can't bring up many Christian principles without running into objections. And we don't want that. I don't know at, at what point that uh, you would call a matter trivial. You know, but... The text says that we will judge that world system, isn't that interesting, as well as judge angels, which I, to me, I mean, means uh, fallen angels, not perfect unfallen angels. I don't see where they need to be judged. So why would we not just suffer wrong, allow ourselves to be defrauded? We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. So here's this brother that you loaned a thousand bucks to and he won't pay you back and you, you want it back. I think the, the scriptures are saying that you come to those who are saints, the elders of the church, if it, that's if the context you're in. Uh, that's the context here. And you, you say so-and-so owes me this much money and he's refused to pay it back. And the elders should uh, adjudicate that. And, and if they say to the man, well, you know, you pay it back, and he doesn't, I think the text says, well, I, <laughs> I guess you suffer that wrong instead of taking it to a legal court and, you know, garnishing his wages or whatever or having him, having him thrown into jail or whatever. I don't think that option is biblical because this is between brethren. Now, that's a hard thing to say. I know. But that's what I think the text is saying. You don't have to agree with me, but that's the position that I'm taking on that. And that's why I don't really loan money to Christians. Okay? Sorry, don't anybody write me asking me for a loan. I just give it to you. I'll just give it to you. I'll, I'll get it. You know, I went through this many, many years ago, and a lot of people never paid me back, but I would rather have Christian friends dealing with that than I would an unjust court who might garnish the guy's wages or, or, or whatever else they might do, something worse, okay? Because for one, that's my brother in Christ. And just as importantly, I don't want my testimony before the unjust or the brethren, for that matter, especially, well, I don't know. I, uh, I don't want that to be something contrary to what I believe and teach about the grace of God that's been, that's been so lavished upon me. Ah. Uh, I think that's uh, basically what we're going to be looking at as we get into this sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians. The first five chapters have been amazing, uh, just full of grace and truth. So I encourage you to continue on studying along with us, while at the same time, I encourage you to look up for our redemption draws nigh. 
I believe there's every reason to believe that we are on the verge, on the precipice, on the edge, you might say, of, of seeing our Lord and one another. And if we're not, then uh, God's grace will sustain us along the way, however long that way might be. I love you all. I truly do. Please continue praying for the direction of this ministry. I am pray for you all constantly. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.